Welcome to Economics and Beyond. I'm Rob Johnson, president of the Institute for New Economic Thinking. I'm here today with Jeffrey Spear, a retired professor of English at New York University, who has taught Victorian studies, art history, done some work on British India. And the focus today is his book, Dreams of an English Eden. He comes from Minneapolis, so there's plenty to talk about in light here, uh, in light of recent developments here on June 1st of 2020. And he's accompanied by his colleague and co-author, Lynn Paramore. Lynn, I am proud to say, works as a research analyst with the Institute for New Economic Thinking. She's one of the most gifted writers and translators, and she helps what we might call brilliant abstract economists reach other people with, with great skill. She's a cultural historian and lives in that space between culture and economics. Together, they wrote a very, very powerful article for our website recently called America's Chilling Experiment in Human Sacrifice on May 14th of 2020, it was published. Thank you both for joining me. Well, thank you, Rob. Thanks for having us. So we're sitting atop, I got, amidst, not atop, amidst a pandemic, COVID-19 here at the beginning of June in 2020. And I'm curious how, whether in the world of events, institutions or ideas each of you is perceiving seeing things some of which you find i'm sure dreadful some of it perhaps uh there are some how you say silver linings to be pointed out and always uh i'm interested in your vision of how to move and evolve society to a better place than has been unmasked by this terrible episode. Mm -hmm. So uh, either Lynn or Jeff, I'll let you choose, uh, but I, would, I wanna hear from each of you. How does this pandemic affect your view of the world we live in and the possible? Um, I'll start out maybe um, and, and, and uh, sort of tee things up for Jeff. I find the work of John Ruskin, whom we focused on in our recent article, a very, a very interesting voice for this moment. He was a Victorian art and social critic, as well as a political economist, who had a moral vision for how the economy uh, could operate and be structured. And that's one of the things that Jeff and I have talked about in our work. And he came out of a moment in English history, the 1840s, uh, following the French Revolution, a time that really could have become a mo uh, an era of reform or an era of revolution. Uh, a lot of questions on the table, a lot of tensions as to you know whether that we were going to have a, a violent uh, transition uh, or a more peaceful one into um, better lives for the English people. And I think that um, I think that starting with that context and that milieu really helps us think about this moment that we're in uh, right now. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Ruskin was was born in 1819, so he was a mid Victorian, and uh, he his background was had roots in Scotland. His mother was an extremely pious uh, evangelical Christian. And uh, his father was a wine merchant uh, and a kind of frustrated gentleman. He wanted Ruskin to grow up to be the kind of, uh, of uh, gentleman that he didn't, because of economic necessity, have a chance to be. So Ruskin's thinking is formed partly by uh, his evangelical heritage, even when he, as many Victorians did, uh, lost his specific faith. Uh, that pattern of thinking uh, which is a strain of evangelical Christianity that sees the world as the fallen garden of Eden and as mankind's responsibility to help restore that Eden. Do you, uh, so did he spend a lot of time, what I'll call 
almost like inductively observing the world and sharing his observations or his interpretations yes. of, of those findings? Yeah, I mean, again, that began uh, be, with his uh, obsession with the work of, of the painter uh, Turner, uh, who, of course, was a, a painter of the natural landscape. And so he became a, an acute observer of the weather, <laughs> as well as, and it, it's a kind of paradox, because he chose his major first work, the modern painters, was a defense of Turner, not as a realist, as we would understand it, but his late work, which is atmospheric. So he became a kind of, on the one hand, uh, his idea then of nature was kind of like a dynamic interchange, not the static thing that he attributed, say, to Dutch painting, where nature was represented conventionally. So there's a kind of phenomenological underpinning to the way he looked at things that, again, carried over to, uh, to social commentary. Interesting. Interesting. I didn't know Turner had played such a role. That's, that's a fascinating bridge. Lynn, uh, when you two sat down to, to create the, your article for INET, what, what was in your mind? What, what, where did the inspiration come from? I think, I yeah, I, I think the inspiration came from the fact that um, Ruskin, as a very trenchant critic of <clears throat> the capitalism of his day, had a very interesting definition of wealth that was different mm -hmm. from economists of the time like John Stuart Mill and others. And he really defined wealth as anything that is availing to life, to the life of the people in a country. And as we were seeing, Jeff and I were seeing the pan pandemic evolve, mm -hmm. it became clear that even though the United States was the wealthiest country on earth, it had become quite impoverished when it came to the, the life and the health of its citizens. And it was accumulating what Ruskin referred to as the opposite of wealth, which is what he called ilf, uh, things that make mm -hmm. a society and its people ill, anything from lack of access to health care to environmental uh, pollution, etc. Um, Ruskin early on in his writing career, wrote a letter to the London Times, and he said that the first duty of a state is to see that every child born therein shall be well housed, clothed, fed, and educated till it attain years of discretion. Uh, and that is uh, something that the United States has obviously been failing in. And so this impoverishment and, and a reorientation of how we view what makes a country and its people wealthy, what makes them happy, uh, seem to be an important discussion to have right now. And then I think it's even become more important since we wrote the article in the context of this mm -hmm. uh, the terrible murder of George Floyd, no. which happened uh, just last week in Minneapolis. Yeah. And, you know, Jeff, you might want to say something about your experience sure. in Minneapolis during the 60s. I think that's uh, coming into a lot of people's mm -hmm. minds right now. Yeah, uh, I was a graduate student at Minnesota um, and during the anti-war period. And when we were demonstrating, uh, we tried uh, to broaden the protest to make it not just about the war, but about local conditions as well. And one of the saddest things for me to see about this whole episode, apart from the immediate tragedy of that man's murder, is how little progress was made there, despite being one of the most liberal spots in the, in the country. And if you look at who they elect to office, it's like a, a, a roadmap for the future. And yet one of the things we were protesting was the fact that most of the police in Minnesota and the police department didn't live in the city because of economic reasons. Again, it was cheaper to live in the suburbs. So you have a police force in, a, in, in all of the city, but of course in the minority area as well, uh, that, that doesn't live there. That's not part of the community. And after 50 years, that still problem has still not been solved, that you have a, uh, uh, in, to some extent, you might say an alien police force in those areas, in that part of Minneapolis, which is not only home to the African American community, but to the uh, Native American community, which hasn't gotten much mention here, though uh, 
their uh, uh, center was burned down in these protests. And uh, a lot of the, uh, since I left, a lot of the uh, South Asian, Southeast Asian population there too. So it's a mixed, a very mixed area. And uh, it, that's one of the things that I found so really disappointing that if a place like Minneapolis can't deal with these issues with the kind of governance it has, it's, um, you know, does make you worry about places in which the problems are even more intractable. Um, and the, the, this particular death itself as, a, as an image then also encapsulated like the, the image of somebody kneeling on a person's neck with, in this insouciant casual manner with his hand in his pocket hmm. is so visceral. I think to people, I think it's one reason that this, this, unlike shootings, which seem to show some space and, and sometimes it seemed to involve a narrative of chase and whatever, this is person to person. It's a, it, you know, and I think there's something about that that just grabbed people, as well as the almost archetypal image of conquest, which goes all the way back, Lynn knows about this, all the way back, say, to ancient Egypt, of your foot on the neck of the people you've conquered. And it's just uh, mm. terrible. It's just really resonant. I think it's one reason that that image has just riveted people and brought them out in the middle of a pandemic. So you could say that these demonstrators, the peaceful demonstrators, are in a sense risking their own lives at this moment to make a statement. You know, stop there. Yeah. Yeah, that I think you're, you're very sensitive in putting together. The, what you might call the, the inescapable nature of this horrid thing that happened to Floyd. Yeah. yeah. And, and it portends uh, what you might call a longer and deeper oppression. I saw Kareem Abdul-Jabbar today mm -hmm. wrote a beautiful piece in the Los Angeles mm -hmm. Times yeah. about the nature of the despair yeah. that people are feeling yeah, I mean, the African American community. The the, um, the legal question about first degree murder. See, in a moral sense, it's first degree murder. In a technical legal sense, it may not be. But to mo the way I see it, what's pressing down through the agent of that one policeman is four hundred years of intent, yes. of evil intent. That that takes place in the transaction just between that one man and another. But it's really the, the intent comes all the way back into the beginning of our, you know, as everybody says, our original sin as a nation, which is slavery. Mm -hmm. And I, I, I originally um, came from North Carolina, which is actually where I've been spending uh, time during the pandemic. And um, one of the things that's always troubled me about America's attitude towards slavery is what seems to me a blind spot about our collective guilt. Um, mm -hmm. I lived most of my adult life in New York City, and you sometimes get the feeling that people think that slavery is something that happened in a particular region of the country, uh, but actually the second largest slave market next to Charleston was on Wall Street. And Wall Street... Uh, <laughs> has had a connection to racist economics, unfortunately, uh, from the beginning. The slave, uh, the slave trade could not have operated without the shipping industry, the insurance industry, the bankers, the mm. financiers. The whole country was so deeply intertwined in this abhorrent economic system that the guilt is really collective. Um, it's it's not something mm -hmm. that happened in one particular place. It's something that we yeah. all bear collective guilt about. And I think that, um, you know, a, a question which is hanging in the air, a moral question about reparations comes up in the context of what happened to George Floyd. And mm -hmm. I think as people are grasping for systemic solutions um, that's yeah. something that we're going to have to perhaps visit. Uh, 
and and own this collective guilt and this collective stain on our history once and for all to all of us as a people. Yeah, and you, you, you know, and uh, I don't let myself off the hook because my people came to this country in the 20th century. When you're interpolated into the culture, uh, you acquire it, the good and the bad, and there's no uh, there's no easy out for it. Um, yeah. I've uh, reminded one of my earliest guests on the podcast was the uh, African American scholar Gerald Horn from University of Houston, and he wrote a very very powerful book. He and I talked about his book Jazz and Justice, but he has another book called The Counter Revolution of 1776: Slave Resistance and the mm -hmm. Origins of the United States of America, which uh, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. how did I say so shows how deeply embedded even at the time of our which you might call mm -hmm. inspiring documents, this mm -hmm. practice had had uh, had become. Yeah, I mean, I want to go back to uh, the founders then just before we move on to Ruskin. Uh, when uh, Jefferson changed the standard formulation of life, liberty, and property, which he inherited, of course, from British tradition, to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, he made a tremendously important ideological switch that of course he could not live up to in his own life. So the paradox, um, you know, the, the paradox is right there at the beginning. Um, life, liberty, and, and property, that formula seems to have had a, 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 a is still in operation, right? Um, the pursuit of happiness is for everybody. Mm -hmm. In your uh, article, I recall, mm -hmm you uh the that you co-authored for inet uh i recall you focused on the world happiness report and so yeah. columbia university studies in relation to that and uh yeah. it, as i recall and i remembered reading this mm -hmm. on the same day i read a, a a piece by david uh brooks in the new york times about the nordic mm -hmm. experience yeah but what where where has where has happiness been most achieved and what type of social organizations uh, has, have these studies found to, to well, well, I'm hardly an that. expert on that kind of thing, but, but one of the things that's quite clear is that in the, in the literal sense of the word, social security has been the thing that has marked the, uh, the success of the Scandinavian countries. Uh, that And if you look at the things that have been undercut since the time of Ronald Reagan, pensions, I, I was astonished to find that a company, of course, could reorganize and get rid of all of its pension obligations, they, which then you know, they want to privatize that. Um, Health care, um, all of the things, uh, unemployment, a guarantee that, that you won't be thrown out in the street if you become unemployed. Um, so it's basically, I could say, in kind of the broadest sense of the word, social security, which actually, ironically, encourages entrepreneurship. Because if you have an idea and you want to pursue it and create a business or something in Sweden, say, you don't have to worry that if your idea fails, you'll be on welfare, in our sense. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, it's not well, I guess, terribly well-known fact, but there's more entrepreneurship per capita in some of these countries than we have, even though we like to say that this is the great home of, of entrepreneurship and invention. And I so that's where Ruskin comes in. Now, go ahead, Lynn. Oh, I was just going to say, I, I think that the um, what we have learned about George Floyd uh, really underscores this point. Um, he, mm -hmm. for example, had uh, hypertension. This is a yeah. condition that is overrepresented mm -hmm. in the black male population yeah. in the United States. And right. it's certainly connected to economic inequality and the 400 years of oppression and walking outside your door and being afraid of a potentially fatal confrontation with the police. Um, all of these things, racism, uh, xenophobia, all of, all of these things we know from social science are exacerbated by economic inequality. And those countries that have uh, uh, less inequality tend to have less social unrest of this kind and, and fewer deaths, uh, what some call deaths of despair, deaths from diseases 
that are caused by mm -hmm. uh, living uh, in poverty and, and living in oppressive yeah. circumstances. Yeah, as we all know, it's very expensive to be poor. Very expensive to be poor. <laughs> in many respects. The, uh, <clears throat> I, I remember, I, I often uh, recall a meeting I had with some Swedish economists at the consulate in New York at the behest of uh, Leif Pogratsky, mm -hmm. who was an old friend of mine and, and was the attache in the United States in New York. And these economists came in and they said to me, Mr. Johnson, the, the old growth model mm -hmm. was the American model, supply side flexibility, and Europe was considered to be sclerotic and bogged down because there were too many rigidities and social protections. But with the advent of globalization mm -hmm. and automation and profound transformation, they cited to me, this was in, uh, let's see, I, th I guess it would have been early 2019, that the kind of presidency that Donald Trump represented mm -hmm. was a symptom of a despair that they thought mm -hmm. was overwhelming America mm -hmm. and that we were not going to be able to adopt technology because our politics would become dysfunctional and violent. And their, their punchline was, we in Scandinavia love the robots we don't protect jobs, we protect people. Hmm. Yeah. Meaning yeah. their health care, their pensions, their children's education, and their ability to be retrained so that in a dynamic sense, yeah. they could be radiant and taking advantage of all these opportunities with all of the humans being confident that they would continue to benefit and that yeah. America had lost any credibility in that regard. Yeah, and in fact, I think it's important to say that this doesn't mean that there's no disharmony or no racial prejudice or anything like that in Scandinavia. Uh, and sometimes it's said that they're like, uh, that they are uh, more uniform populations and that we couldn't do that here because we're so disparate, but that seems to me like a terrible cop-out. Uh, in other words, this, this economic idea of putting people first uh, works even despite the fact that there is in fact racial tension uh, in, in these countries that have taken in immigrants um, since, you know, the last 50 years. Um, so it's, it, it, you know, it, it's not, it's not paradise on earth, it's, but it is a better system. <laughs> well, and, and it goes to this definition that, that, uh, that John Rusk yeah. put forward of wealth, that there yeah. is an understanding that the wealth of the country, again, lies in uh, the, uh, I mm -hmm. love the, the phrase, the radiant lives of its citizens. And also, yeah. you know, I, I think another R Ruskinian perspective that's useful for us now is not only it is, it, is it the life of individual citizens, it is their social life, their life together, yeah. the recognition in economics mm -hmm. that the human being is social, is the member of a mutually responsible community and not yeah. Uh, we're not just atomistic units, separate economic yeah. units. And this this really goes into something that Jeff and I have talked about, um, the importance of narrative and storytelling. Economics, mm -hmm. mainstream economics, neoclassical economics has told a story about human beings that is fiction, that we are these uh, separate units working in our economics, uh, self driven by our economic self-interest. Mm -hmm. That is actually not how human beings live. It is a fiction, but it is a fiction that Donald Trump has picked up on very successfully, for mm -hmm. example, and uh, and some on the conservative side, that the, the story of the salvation of our country, I mean, I think everyone can agree right now that something is wrong, whether you're on the right or the left or whoever you may be all over the globe, there's a feeling of anxiety that something is wrong. We, we, we all agree on that. But the salvation and where it's going to come from, Donald Trump would put it forward that it comes with individual empowerment. Mm -hmm. Where someone like Ruskin would have said, no, it is our collective empowerment. It is our collective salvation. Mm -hmm. um, he was a, 
a storyteller who was interested in the plot structure uh, known as romance, where you have a hero fighting against a uh, fighting against a dragon, good versus evil. But the the hero doesn't have to be an individual hero; it can be a collective hero. For example, the essential workers during the pandemic, uh, the people who are producing the materials that can help uh, help us combat this uh, this virus foe. Um, it is a way of, of thinking about our interaction and mutual dependency that I think is so important at this moment. And it's a difficult narrative to achieve, I think. The individual empowerment narrative is hard to argue against because, for example, in Ruskin's time, you had a very clear idea of Christian social values that you could pit against capitalist practices. Mm-hmm. But we don't have that now. We don't have an agreed upon oh. set of practices. Later in Ruskin's career, he might have even said that exploiting your fellow human or exploiting nature was a violation of natural laws. We don't really yeah. talk that way either. And Jeff and I mm-hmm. were discussing, so what is it? What is it we can pose in opposition? Um, what, what, what does it violate when we exploit nature and we exploit our fellow human? And we, and we agreed it's a violation of what a thinker like Ruskin would imagine as whole systems. And some thinkers that Rob, yeah. I know mm-hmm. you've had on the podcast, such as Jeremy Lent, I think could relate to this idea mm-hmm. that it's whole systems we live within that become violated yeah. when we, um, yeah. when we damage. Yeah. And when they, be- when they become segmented and that's, that was the argument of people like Barry Commoner and the original ecology movement that much of the prosperity in capitalism has been produced by creating a, uh, a debt uh, the, to nature. That if you uh, have a factory that pollutes the water, uh, uh, that uh, pollutes the air, uh, and so on, that uh, you can produce a, a much cheaper product, this, going back to 19th century kinds of examples, than a place that pays a decent wage and is careful to clean up after itself. So where does the debt go? It's very often assumed by the people who have to clean their water where they wouldn't have had to filter their air. Uh, and very often that's put on to the state. But uh, so the, 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 the actual, you might say, real profit in Ruskin's terms of the firm is much smaller than its capital return because they've taken much of the cost and dumped it on other folks. And so... <laughs> So looking at things as a whole system, that's why he said, even if you hold private, by the way, this is one reason he supported a graduated income tax and tax on property, uh, very unpopular in his time. Uh, you, you have a responsibility because you, you don't own the land in, a, in an absolute sense. You're a custodian of it. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And, and it's interesting now, it, to me, the uh, the awareness of climate mm-hmm. is yeah. It's not even one person or a group. It's how different countries can affect the whole world. Yeah, I've I've talked to many guests on this podcast about the tension now between the development of India. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And this is a country that has limited resources for an investment in the transformation of an energy structure Mm -hmm. that will help the rest of the world a great deal. And yet we don't seem to be able to marshal our resources among the advanced countries to help them help us. And I, I just since there are failings in every respect, I'm, I'm always very attracted to the notion that Naomi Klein brought out in her book, This mm-hmm. Changes Everything, yeah. meaning the change in response to the challenge of climate change eliminates the fantasy that an unfettered market mm-hmm. can take care of human needs. And it sets a precedent for a different consciousness 
in a different organization of society. Yeah, and I, mean, I think uh, I think your work, in, as you mentioned, very commoner. Uh, mm-hmm. I, I think these, how I say, the, these different visions are beckoning us now. Yeah, well, you see, Ruskin saw this clearly in a way that we can't quite now, in that uh, he he was uh, present when the the uh, it, when industry was coal fired, so he literally saw a pristine environment in the countryside turned black from coal. <laughs> so there, and, and there was no question about who caused it. I mean, the steam engines were putting out that smoke. And so the area around Northern England, around the Wolverhampton became known as the black country around Wolverhampton. There was mm. so much pollution. Uh, it, it's a little less clear, uh, or we've certainly made the narrative a lot fuzzier about the causes of our present climate. And there's a, the uh, ozone layer and things like this are very abstract uh, to most people. And so you don't see day to day as vividly, say, as Rusk is with, the damage until we start noticing weird things. Like a, a few years back, I noticed I took a car trip and came home and realized there were only like two or three bugs splattered on my windshield. And remembering when I was young, if you went out for a drive in the summer, you know, you, you had, you had to uh, wipe out, you know, there were all kinds of things you would have run into that were, what happened to the bugs? You know, yeah. we, we don't have those bugs. Some of them, we're not here. Uh, well, I so, think that, that's where you get into the whole <laughs> systems idea again. And this- exactly. This yeah, idea yeah. Of, of, of connectivity. And, you know, Jeff and I, with, with our background in literature, talk a lot about language. And the very language that mm-hmm. we use to talk about nature is something I think Ruskin would find problematic. We refer to it as the environment. It sounds yeah. something that is wholly external to ourselves, something that is out there mm-hmm. uh, rather than nature, mm-hmm. which, yeah. is, which is a word I think is much more honest. It is uh, yeah. something that is within and without, and there is no real meaningful separation between the two. Yeah, and the coronavirus reminds us because it is entirely a, a biological phenomenon. Mm-hmm. And we are, we are mammals. <laughs> and, and we're subject to uh, little bits of RNA that want to replicate themselves. <laughs> and our uh, response is yeah. collective. Yeah. Um, hmm. So, Lynn, what is the story that you want to write that the pandemic, the COVID-19 virus, has awakened so that people will be able to comprehend the the lesson of your vision? It is a story... (laughs) And I think it has been never been told as succinctly as Muhammad Ali told it in a poem that he wrote that I know you're very fond of, Rob. And that poem is goes like this: "Me, we." To me, that really says it all. That is the transition that we have to make at this moment. That that is um, the key to all of it the key to new economic thinking, the key to social reform, the key to reforming our prison systems is to Mm -hmm. understand uh, fundamentally that we are connected and that we have a mutual responsibility and to not be afraid of putting our story in a moral context and using value laden words to talk about Mm -hmm. what we we, um, need and demand and deserve as a people. Um, that is the plot that I want to see unfolding. And I would like to, you know, talk and think more about not just leadership in a general sense, but narrative leadership. Um, one of the things that's become clear in this pandemic, mm-hmm. we have these images, in, and particularly in the mm-hmm. George Floyd murder, we have these images flashing constantly on our television mm-hmm. screens. But it's stories that put the images together in a way that we mm-hmm. understand and comprehend and move us forward as a society. And the internet, for all its wonder, 
and the media that we have now, sometimes we are mm-hmm. just lost in a chaos of images that aren't mm-hmm. woven together into a coherent story. And I think people who want to challenge the narrative of neoclassical economics or the narrative of politicians like Donald Trump, we have to we have to really think hard about um, regaining our plot and m- making yeah. it clear that um, our plot is one of a collective salvation and not just an individual one. Yeah, and it's a necessary, I mean, uh, again, since Americans uh, as a whole have so little interest in history, it's worthwhile remembering that the nation state, that that we're one of the oldest nation states, and the nation state has not been the natural form of human organization forever and ever. Uh, historically speaking, they come and go. So the idea that the United States is some kind of exceptional uh, a place that's going to uh, go on forever while the rest fade away, we're in a very, very troubling moment. And I, at times it reminds me of, of what it was like in, in the 1930s, which I don't remember and only know historically. But uh, people should remember that uh, uh, Hitler took over not when he was winning elections, but when his party had peaked and was uh, declining. Uh, and so this whole it can't happen here narrative is, is uh, we're in a very, very perilous time, uh, you know, in terms of what our political future and uh, uh, because each of these images and so forth, if we make up a story about it, that story is going to be determined by ideology. And we have a very divided, ideologically divided. And by ideology, I don't mean a conscious held viewpoint, but more like the philosopher um, uh, Althusser would put it, that it's the it's our way of making contradictory things cohere. And it's not a conscious process. And that's one reason it's so hard to bend these things around. Uh, because um, one image, an image does not tell its own story. Uh, and so who's doing the storytelling is really an important issue. Uh, I'd like to go back if we could, just to say that there's an alternative possible way using Adam Smith and our own history uh, uh, of um, how economics develop um, that uh we that there's a there's I say there's two routes that might have come out of Adam Smith, who was after all a moral philosopher. Uh, the one we're used to is the story of the division of labor. Uh, one man draws out the wire, another straightens it, a third cuts it, a fourth points it, a fifth grinds it. The top for receiving the head, the head makes two to three distinct operations, and so on. Uh, that's the that's the story that's generally told, but in the second volume of, of uh, the work, one of the later volumes, he says something else about the consequences of the division of labor. Um, the workman having no occasion to exert his understanding or exercise his invention in finding out expedients for removing difficulties, which never occur. In other words, he doesn't have to do, invent anything. He naturally loses, therefore, the habit of such exertion and generally becomes as stupid and ignorant as is possible for a human creature to become. His dexterity at his own particular trade seems in this manner to be acquired at the expense of his intellectual, social, and martial virtues. But in every improved and civilized society, this is the state into which the laboring poor, that is the great body of people, must necessarily fall, and who would have thought Adam Smith would have said this, unless the government takes some pains to prevent it. If that were our Adam Smith, maybe we would have a different basis for the way we think about um, you know, our economics. Um, and, and if we also thought about the state as that which enriches, sustains, mm-hmm. pr- provides uh, the conditions for the radiant light yeah. of its citizens. I mean, I think that's yeah. Ruskin's other great insight. Mm-hmm. And it would help if, yeah. if we used a Ruskinian framework to think about our response mm-hmm. to the pandemic, for example, it would become yeah. very clear what kinds of choices we need to make about mm-hmm. sending people to work with or without sure. protective equipment. We would know the answer to that yeah. question. It yeah. would, um, it would, w- it would be um, 
a very easy judgment to make, and we would know that it's the state's responsibility to make that judgment. Well, let's put it this way. If, if there's a moral hazard to people getting more money on unemployment than they would get if they went back to their job, as the Lindsey Grahams of the world seem to think, does that say something about the people's motivations, or does it say something about the miserable wages they're paid? Right. Yeah, I think the uh, it, it's it's. I, Lynn, you said it very well earlier on in this conversation. It's about the nature of the narratives mm-hmm. that people have come to how you say emotionally be attracted to, and how it influences what you might call the resistance to caring. And to go back to Muhammad Ali, the me and we. Mm -hmm. I think what you were suggesting, Lynn, is that me is better off when I work in the we system. Yes, me Mm -hmm. is dependent on the well-being of we. (laughs) Yes, it's not one or the other. And the short-sightedness or the vacuity of awareness as to what really matters is what you and Ruskin are exploring. Yes. I mean, I think, I think it comes really clear in situations like discussion of a vaccine for COVID-19. That's only going to be effective if we look at it as a we solution. Mm -hmm. If we look at it individually, some people might prefer for various reasons not to have their children vaccinated, but unfortunately uh, we're all connected in this. And the way it works yeah. is if we do it as a we. Our individual mm-hmm. choices um, are intimately, and, and, and our individual lives are intimately connected to how we operate as a whole, uh, as a whole yeah. system. Yeah. I mean, our, our country took a strange turn when, uh, uh, I guess, Reagan was the great proponent of it, uh, thought it was more important that everybody get a dollar back that there was theirs than that everybody put in a dollar for some general good. I mean, uh, uh, we've lost our, uh, we promote the abstraction of liberty and democracy and all of these things until the words themselves are emptied of their content. Um, And uh, our sense of collective identity is right now, I think, deeply fractured. I, I think that's true, Jeff. And I think that's one of the reasons that George Floyd's dying words, I can't breathe, mm-hmm. yeah, uh, absolutely. Have, have been such an important message in the protest because I can't breathe has become a collective cry during mm-hmm. the protest. Yeah. It, it seems to lend itself not only to the moment of reckoning with police brutality, but as you mm-hmm. as you said, a, 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 an oppressive system that has its boot on the neck of the people um, of an environment yeah. that is so polluted that people can't breathe in it. It's a cry yeah. um, that is both an individual cry and a collective cry that goes to the very essence of what Ruskin talked about the um, right. the right to lead a, a, a radiant life. Yeah, and breath breath is the essence of life, and it also is metaphoric. Uh, you know, the, the beginning of the creation of the world, and the, the you know the, the, the God God breathes upon the waters, right? I mean, so you know, breath is in like even in yoga, <laughs> uh, breathing and breath is our is our our life. Uh, you know, the system of, of panic when you're in a panic you tighten up and you can't breathe. Um, so the, the, that very, I think that those words of his have this really powerful resonance, like you're saying, Lynn, not about the, just about his own individual life and he can't breathe, but in a certain pretty literal sense, we're all being suffocated. And that's, if there's to be a crusade of some kind, then, then saving the planet is also saving ourselves. I mean, everybody can sense that we're off course, profoundly off course. This is not the world we want to hand to our children. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, but where I'm, where I struggle and I'm asking you both Mm -hmm. to explore this is that 
is it the institutions that need to be repaired or is the real disease the ideas, the ideology, and the narratives that are pointing us in the wrong directions and that those institutions mm -hmm. are a reflection of that misguided vision? I'm very uh, attracted to the writings of an old uh, man who studied a lot about Eastern, uh, mm -hmm. Eastern philosophy. His name was R.C. Zayner. He was at uh, Oxford University in the 50s and early 60s. And he has a, a quote that's an epigraph of a music book that I own, where he says, loss of faith in a given religion does not by any means imply the eradication of the religious instinct. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It merely means that instinct temporarily repressed will seek an object elsewhere. So I want to I want to bring this to mm -hmm. you particularly, Jeff, because mm -hmm. you you spoke about the wealth of nations. Mm -hmm. And my my understanding of history was at the time of the Industrial Revolution and the onset of the wealth of nations, much of the church mm -hmm. and moral and ethical language had been the discourse of governance. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It lost its credibility because the church was seen to be siding with yeah. the landed aristocracy, the oligarchy of the time, and contributing and legitimating oppression. Oh, yeah. And after the Industrial Revolution, governance, for reasons that I think cohere, moved to this antiseptic, scientific, quote, mm -hmm. value-free technocracy. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But, but that in itself is a false consciousness because mm -hmm. there were values embedded in every action. Sure. But I can understand why a practitioner, say in a finance ministry or a central bank or the tax office or an agricultural office, would not want to speak in moral and ethical language for fear of being suspected of being part of that old rancid power structure where the church had misused its power over ideas and committed to uh, contributed to oppression. So we're at a place now where, which you might call the dry technocratic mm -hmm. value free notion exhibited some failures in the era of Stalin and Mao and other places. And it, it seemed like the void was filled by this deity called the free market in capitalism. Mm -hmm. yeah. Zayner's mm -hmm. seeking an object elsewhere for the religious instinct seemed to take on a secular form. And this, my intuition is this, this is breaking down. So this is a long-winded way of framing a question. Mm -hmm. Can we just go to institutional reform or do we have to go to ideological re-examination upheaval and get back to defining what it is that matters and create institutions that are a means to that end, despite the concentrated wealth and opposition that will always be present. I think, well, I think it's the latter. No, go ahead. Do you want to talk about it? No, go ahead. Okay, as I say, I think it's the latter, but of course, in the, these institutions and structures, um, you brought up this, the, the, uh, they can be transformed, uh, you know, in a sense, spiritually. Uh, the, uh, the, the, as you pointed out, the presence of uh, the Citizens United uh, decision, for instance, changed the nature of politics because both parties in our country had to go to the same people uh, for support, it, it seemed. Now, the, the, through the internet, this development of grassroots financing is one of the things that's led to uh, uh, the, the uh, candidacies that um, are, are not so dependent on the big money. But, uh, that's, um, but spiritually speaking, this is one of Ruskin's main points, is that the development of this free market ideology somehow gave the market a moral free pass. That they saw, but that, uh, that was his main objection to the idea that you could develop a science of economics and then when you decide to apply it to 
actual situations bring in things like human affections, emotions, and so forth. Uh, he, he, what he was pointing out is that basically you're, 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 you're actually dividing human beings apart at that point because mm -hmm. they do have this instinct for reverence and religion, which will find its place. And so why should, the mar why should your behavior as a merchant or a person in the marketplace not be subject to the values of your professed religion which is supposed to govern all your behavior. Uh, one of the things that has struck me again about politics on the left is this kind of moral unilateral disarmament. Uh, you don't have to be a believing Christian to say that Jesus would not have some pretty bad things to say about some pretty, what we consider the fundamentals of market capitalism, right? Uh, so the, to leaving that religious rhetoric to the right wing has been, I think, a terrible mistake. Um, that there is a there is a moral component that could be appealed to, uh, and it, but it requires something other than the kind of cliche language that we get. We we are so used to these parades of abstractions uh, that uh, uh, that Trump almost makes into a caricature, where we act as though these abstract words like democracy and freedom and all of these things somehow do work for us, you know, and they don't. Uh, they're they're camouflage, right? Mm -hmm. So, uh, one thing I would love to see, and we're not going to get it, I'm afraid, from uh, from Joe Biden, would have been a a really a moral and values based candidacy in this moment that could employ uh, the religion uh, language of of all faiths and indeed moral philosophy, right? About uh, in in looking at these things. That, that there are issues of right and wrong here, not just issues of productivity, uh, uh, you know, and uh, externalities and, uh, uh, you know, capital return and so on. Anyway, uh, so I think that, that that's the best I can do at the moment. <laughs> I, I would say that I think that, um, Rob, your question about, you know, whether we go to institutions before we go to uh, mm -hmm. something perhaps more fundamental, I, I think... You know, the observation has been made that the world arises out of language. Mm -hmm. that, you know, it arises out of culture and the metaphors mm -hmm. we use shape our values and our culture and, and those in turn shape our institutions. And I think we're mm -hmm. in the midst of a transition which which will be reflected in language one way or another. It, it's a it's a process that sometimes in history can happen in a generation or two. We, we, may, we may be in a moment um, of this kind of shift, but I think you know, the nature of the shift is a movement from a self-focus to a whole focus. You know, we were talking about whole mm -hmm. systems later. Mm -hmm. Muhammad mm -hmm. Ali, me, we framework. I think that's a way of thinking that certainly has existed in the West you know, ever since Heraclitus. Yeah but it hasn't necessarily been the dominant uh, kind of narrative trope, at, at least in the last couple of hundred years. So I, again, I'm, I'm sort of looking for um, language revolution and narrative revolution uh, as much as anything right now. Well, I find it, uh, how would I say? I find it like I'm, I'm an exploring and I'm trying to understand the resistance to change mm -hmm. when change is so clearly profoundly necessary and i think that the pandemic the environmental crisis uh all of these things are very very uh big what i'll call more than nudges they're mm -hmm. throttling our consciousness yeah. so that clinging. I remember the philosopher Stephen, Stephen Toulman wrote a book essentially about from the 30 years war to the end of Ronald Reagan called Cosmopolis. And one of his key findings was the notion that the, uh, 
how would I say this? At the time when you are unsettled and you become afraid, the tendency is to look back to the familiar rather than mm -hmm. forward to what is necessary. Mm -hmm. And, uh, but, but I, I must say, uh, I think the, this episode is so extreme, we can't go back. And so I, I, think, I think that may be the silver lining yeah. of yeah. how horrid this is. I think you're right, yeah. Rob. And I think that, um, you know, one of the hopeful things neuroscientists have been showing us recently that our brains are flexible. We, we can rewire mm -hmm. them. We can learn new ways of of of, uh, of thinking and doing things. You know, there's the, the example of when someone has a stroke. Uh, sometimes uh, certain activities are impossible, but the brain it's it's possible to rewire it and train it and um, and and learn again. And we have a cognitive flexibility. We also have a cultural flexibility. You know, like I was saying, sometimes we have we have pretty amazing shifts that happen. Uh, just in a generation or two. I mean, you look at the environmental movement that took off in the 1960s with Rachel Carlson's mm -hmm. Silent Spring. Um, we, we have had these moments mm -hmm. of transition and they unfortunately do often come out of very um, chaotic and bloody circumstances such as the one that we have now. But um, we, we don't have to be stuck. Um, we, we are flexible. That's one of the things that makes us human and transformation yeah. is never out of our reach. And we're, one of the most Im impressive things and hopeful things that's come out of this has been the many actions of ordinary people in the absence of proper leadership, um, how, how people have stepped up, uh, you know, and, and helped their neighbor. And I mean, look at the uh, private mask making industry that came up out of nowhere. Um, mm -hmm. So, I mean, the potential, we certainly have the potential uh, if that could be, you know, Put into some kind of um, uh, if it doesn't just go away and everybody go back to their own house after the um, crisis is over there is a potential movement here it seems like and um, as we've been talking that's, about that's, really, up, that's, and that's democratic in the, in the real sense and there's really no normal to go back to right now that's both a very painful thing that's right but it's also a, a, a thing that makes a uh, transition possible the pandemic is going to be with us, and it's a feedback loop and a spiral that can be very destructive for a while. People who are protesting may get the virus. That's going to impact communities of color more than others. Uh, but it is mm -hmm. also going to force us uh, to remain in this moment of tension and struggle until we have figured something out. It's, it's almost like the, the, the boot of history is on our necks right now. And it's not mm -hmm. going to let up un until we come up with a new framework, a new path forward. It, it, it's um, yeah. we, we, there is no, there is no normal. Yeah, people, you know, it, it's hard to, to. I mean, I keep thinking again of the of the '30s and my own. As of course, I can say I'm old guy and all that, but my own relative passivity in seeing what's happening out there. And wondering again, you know, that uh, 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 did, did I not take action? You know, I don't know what's going to happen next, but if the worst comes, you know, where was I? Uh, when I mean, it's one thing to see all these things and pontificate about them, but where am I? Um, maybe, you know. Yes. Well, I think... Uh... That's a good, that's almost a good title for this session. Where am I? Where are we? <laughs> Where is me? <laughs> but I, uh, I guess, you know, I, uh, I love how much the two of you are exploring. Again, for our listeners today, America's Chilling Experiment in Human Sacrifice at, on the INET website by Lynn Paramore and Jeffrey L. Spear is a tremendous article. And I, as I read it the other day, I heard a song from the rock band U2. 
in the in the last verse the lyrics go one love one blood one life you've got to do what you should one life with each other sisters and my brothers one life but we're not the same but we get to carry each other carry each other i want to thank you both and thank you each for thank you bringing your vision and this challenge to this podcast and i hope that uh, we can convene again and that you keep writing and i can keep illuminating your insights in the weeks and months ahead but for right now i just want to thank you both for a beautiful exploration and uh, i look forward to our next one thank you very much rob yeah, thank you, Rob. I really appreciate it. The pleasure's mine. Thank you. Bye-bye. And check out more from the Institute for New Economic Thinking at ineteconomics.org.